I have a big competitive acquisition coming up, and I want to use the trade-off approach to select the proposal that represents the best value to the government. I have a pretty good idea of how to evaluate both the technical merits of each offeror's proposed approach to performing the contract and each offeror's track record of past performance, but I'm not sure how to evaluate what a contract with each offeror is going to cost the government. Okay, in order to make a well-informed, well-reasoned trade-off between the evaluated non-cost merits of a particular proposal and the cost to the government of performance of the effort proposed, we need to make sure we have a good plan for how we're going to evaluate that cost. And now is the right time to have this conversation before we start drafting the acquisition plan, source selection plan, and solicitation. So where do we start? Since we are talking about how much the contract will cost the government, I think we have to start by looking at the contract type. Remind me again what you're trying to procure through this acquisition. Basically, we are looking for a contractor to really push the envelope with this development effort. We want next generation prototypes that we can then put through some rigorous field testing. Which means that there are a lot of uncertainties inherent in this performance of this contract. And since this development effort involves so many uncertainties that a contractor should not reasonably be expected to put a fixed price on, I think the most appropriate contract type to use is some sort of cost reimbursement contract. Okay, if we're going to use a cost reimbursement contract, then we have to evaluate cost realism. What is cost realism? Cost realism is an evaluation concept that is used to compel an offerer to show that its proposed cost is consistent with its proposed technical approach to performing the contract effort. Is that really necessary? Yes, because the legal obligation for payment is different for different contract types. Under a fixed price contract, the amount the government is obligated to pay is fixed when the contract is awarded. The government agrees to pay the fixed contract price no matter what costs are actually incurred by the contractor in performing the contract. However, under a cost reimbursement contract, the amount the government is obligated to pay is not fixed when the contract is awarded. The government agrees to pay the contractor basically all the costs actually incurred by the contractor in performing the contract. In other words, the award of a cost reimbursement contract is a promise by the government to pay whatever it actually costs to perform the effort. And that also means that the dollar figures in an offeror's proposal, and those ultimately included in the contract, are not binding fixed prices for the effort proposed. So are you saying that the dollar figures that an offeror puts in its proposal are not binding on the offeror? Exactly. All the dollar figures proposed and those ultimately included in the contract are simply estimates of the costs, what the offeror thinks it will incur in the performance of the contract. The legal obligation is to pay for all the costs actually incurred, which may be higher or lower than these estimates. Which is why the FAR requires us to evaluate cost realism whenever we are going to award a cost reimbursement contract. Since the government's obligation to pay is not fixed to a specific amount, and since the dollar figure is proposed, and those included in the contract are just estimates, and, since we are going to make a source selection decision based on trade-offs between these cost estimates and the evaluated non-cost merits of the proposals, then obviously, we want these cost estimates to be as accurate and reliable as possible before we make that decision. This is the concept underlying cost realism, to evaluate these cost estimates proposed by the offerers in such a way that we are reasonably sure that we are looking at the best possible estimate of what this contract is ultimately going to cost the government. That's right. And a cost realism evaluation also serves to verify the offeror's understanding of the requirements, assess the degree to which the cost proposal accurately reflects the approaches and or risk assessments made in the technical proposals, and assess the extent to which the costs included in the cost proposal accurately represent the work effort included in the technical proposal. Okay, so what's the end result of all this verifying and assessing? Do we still have non-binding cost estimates we are going to use in our source selection decision? Well, yes, you still have estimates. 
but the end result of the cost realism evaluation is supposed to be an estimate by the government evaluators using their own informed judgment, as opposed to just relying on the offeror's estimate of what the actual cost obligation of the government will most likely be if that particular offeror receives the award. So the primary task for the cost evaluators in a cost realism evaluation is to come up with a specific dollar figure, which represents the government's best estimate of what a particular offeror's proposed approach will ultimately cost the government under a cost reimbursement contract, right? Yes, that dollar figure is usually called the probable cost. Always remember that a conclusion that cost is unrealistic is not by itself a sufficient end result for a cost realism evaluation. The probable cost figure must also be determined. Does this mean we may actually be adjusting an offeror's proposed dollar figures if the cost realism evaluation finds that these figures don't reflect the probable cost of contract performance? Yes, but keep in mind that we will only adjust the proposed dollar figures for the purposes of evaluation. We will still put the offeror's proposed dollar figures in the contract if that offeror turns out to be the winner. Okay. It seems like an offeror may not be too happy about us adjusting its proposed dollar figures, especially if that offeror loses out on an award because of that adjustment. So could someone please explain to me how to properly conduct a cost realism evaluation and adjust an offeror's proposed dollar figures? I don't want to get in trouble for doing it wrong. That's an excellent question, but the answer isn't simple. This may be the most difficult aspect of the cost realism evaluation concept. Why is that? Because there are no statutes or regulations that either require or prohibit any specific methodology for conducting the cost realism evaluation. Case law from both the General Accounting Office and the courts has consistently held that a contracting agency's cost realism methodology involves the exercise of informed business judgment. Even if a protester challenges the cost realism evaluation, it will not be successful unless the offeror can show that the government's determination lacks a reasonable basis. Therefore, an agency may conduct a cost realism evaluation any way it wants to, as long as whatever methodology the agency uses is reasonably related to the purpose of the evaluation, which, as we just discussed, is to make an informed judgment of what cost the government would most likely incur by awarding a contract to that particular offeror. Okay, but does this case law really help me understand what methodology to use? What the case law tells us is that we have the discretion to design and tailor a methodology that works best for our particular acquisition. We just have to do our homework when writing the source selection plan to discuss, brainstorm, and develop an appropriate methodology for this particular acquisition. While the case law doesn't specify a particular methodology, it does provide us with some basic principles that we must satisfy as we develop our methodology. I always like to consider these our design guidelines and limits. And those guidelines and limits are? First, the methodology must revolve around an independent analysis of the realism of each offeror's proposed costs based upon that offeror's particular approach personnel, and circumstances. The methodology must be designed to reasonably predict the probable cost that will result from the performance of the proposed technical approach by the proposed personnel. Second, the mechanical application of formulas or government estimates or the mere acceptance of costs as proposed is not enough. There must be some independent analysis and judgment applied in the methodology. Third, we are not required to conduct an in-depth cost analysis or the verification of each and every cost item, but the methodology must support the exercise of informed judgment by the contracting agency. Fourth, while the government has broad discretion in designing the methodology and the scope of its cost realism analysis, it is important to remember that there is also an increased level of scrutiny in this area. Therefore, careful thought and planning must go into the question of how the cost realism evaluation will be conducted in any particular acquisition. If we're going to get that kind of scrutiny every time we do one of these cost realism evaluations, we should also make sure we execute whatever methodology we design using a very logical and fair business process. I suggest the following framework for that process. First, 
we apply whatever methodology we have designed to analyze the offeror's proposed approach, effort, and personnel and determine a specific dollar figure that represents the government's best estimate of what the particular offeror's proposed approach will probably cost the government when the contract is complete. Second, wherever the government's estimated dollar figures differ from the offeror's proposed dollar figures, these disparities should be brought to the offeror's attention during the discussions after the initial competitive range is set. Third, the offeror will then have the opportunity to respond by providing an explanation, revision, or both. Fourth, the offeror's responses should then be analyzed, again using our methodology. Finally, when the analysis is completed, if the government's estimate of the probable cost is still higher than the estimated cost in the offeror's proposal, the offeror's estimated cost should be adjusted for purposes of evaluation only. The amount of the adjustment would be the difference between the government's evaluated probable cost estimate and the offeror's final proposed cost estimate. Okay, I'm still not exactly sure what we are talking about when we refer to methodology. We are talking about how the government evaluation team is going to go about evaluating the offeror's cost proposal to determine whether the costs as proposed represent what the government realistically expects to pay for the proposed effort. For example, if an offeror's technical proposal proposed 1,000 hours of labor to build something, but the cost proposal only included 800 hours for that effort, then, unless the offeror fixes this discrepancy during discussions, a proper cost realism analysis should result in the adjustment of the cost proposal for evaluation purposes only by adding the cost of an additional 200 hours of labor to the estimated costs in the offeror's cost proposal. So the cost realism assessment is just looking for discrepancies between what's in the technical proposal and what's in the cost proposal, right? No, that should only be part of the analysis. If we are trying to determine what the government realistically expects to pay if we give a particular offeror the contract, we also should be evaluating whether we believe the proposed performance will in fact meet the contract requirements. Now I'm confused. Isn't that what the technical factor evaluators are doing? Correct. But a lack of understanding by the offeror can also affect the cost of performance. For example, Suppose there is a requirement to develop and deliver five units of a new system. Prior to delivery, the new system must pass development testing. An offeror proposes to use one of the five units it intends to deliver as the unit it will put through testing. However, the government's evaluation team believes that the system used for testing will probably be destroyed during testing. Therefore, the evaluation team believes the offeror will actually have to build six units instead of five, one for testing and five for delivery. Building six units will clearly cost more. As before, if this discrepancy still exists after this issue has been raised to the offeror during discussions, a proper cost realism analysis should result in the adjustment of the cost proposal for evaluation purposes only by adding the cost differential between building six and building five to the cost estimates in the offeror's cost proposal. Okay. What if the government's estimate of the probable cost is lower than the offeror's proposed cost estimate? Great question. This one usually causes the most conversation when trying to develop and tailor a cost realism methodology for a particular acquisition. Since there is no specific required methodology, there's not really a right or wrong answer to this question. We have to decide what makes sense and is reasonable within the context of each acquisition. It seems to me that we should not adjust the proposed cost if it is higher than our probable cost estimate. The proposed costs should only be adjusted where the proposed costs are considered too low. Why do you say that? First, this is a competitive acquisition and so the forces of competition will control proposals that are too high. In other words, if an offeror's proposed cost is too high relative to the other offerers in the competition, that offeror will probably not win the contract. Second, under a cost reimbursement contract, 
If the offeror's proposed cost is higher than what turns out to be the actual cost of performance, the government is only obligated to pay the lower actual cost. So this just does not represent a great cost risk to the government as an unrealistically low proposal does, where the government would be obligated to pay the higher actual costs of performance. But what about the offer who is not successful, at least in part because of its high evaluated cost? Couldn't that offer claim that it is unfair for the government to only adjust upward? I don't see it as unfair. As we just talked about, the government should definitely point out the disparities between the government's probable cost estimate and the offeror's proposed cost estimate during discussions. This would include all disparities, high and low. The offeror would then have an opportunity to explain and or revise its cost estimate. If, after all that, the offeror still maintains that its costs are going to be higher than what our evaluators have estimated, and we're going to award a contract that obligates the government to pay whatever the actual costs are, it just doesn't make sense to me to adjust a proposed cost estimate downward for the purposes of our evaluation and source selection decision. I agree. Only adjust up, not down, seems to be a sound, reasonable, and logical rule of thumb to use in these cost realism evaluations. Okay, I understand that rule of thumb. But now let's suppose that the offeror whose proposal has been adjusted up is chosen as the winner. Do we award the contract at that higher value? No. The contract will be awarded at the lower estimated cost figures contained in the offeror's final proposal. Remember, the adjustments are for the purpose of evaluation only. However, that does not mean you have just saved some program funds and can spend them elsewhere. What it does mean is that the program office and contracting officer are on notice at the time of award that contract performance is likely to result in a cost overrun. So be prepared. Make sure you set aside and fence the extra money that will be needed. Maybe you even want to make this a topic to discuss at the post-award conference. Okay, that makes sense. Now that all this is clear, there are a couple more things I'd like the team to think about before we actually start drafting the acquisition plan, source selection plan, and solicitation. First, we need to make sure that the people who are going to evaluate cost realism have the appropriate training and experience in cost analysis. Second, we need to make sure that all the information we will need from the offerers in order to accomplish the cost realism evaluation is identified so that we can specifically ask for it in the solicitation. Some of the types of information I'm thinking we might need are quantity and mix of labor hours, engineering, labor and overhead rates, make or buy plans, a matrix of labor type and quantity to be applied to each element of the work breakdown structure, materials, and other direct costs. Let me caution you all that the amount of information required from the offerers is another area where one size definitely does not fit all. The amount of information required should depend on the complexity of the procurement and what information is already available to the government. You may not necessarily need what is often called full-blown cost and pricing data for a cost realism evaluation. Remember one of the guidelines I mentioned earlier. We don't necessarily have to conduct an in-depth cost analysis or verify every single cost element. The rule of thumb here should be, don't ask for more information than what is needed to accomplish the cost realism evaluation. That's good to know. Depending on the methodology we come up with, Maybe we can cut down on the amount of information we need to have the offeror submit. Yes, and before we issue the solicitation, we should all sit down and take a close look at the extent and type of information we have decided to ask for, as well as the format in which it should be submitted. We want to assure ourselves that, when submitted as we've asked for it, this information will show us the necessary correlation between the technical proposals and the cost proposal that we need to successfully accomplish our cost realism evaluation. Great discussion. I've learned a lot about cost realism, and especially that we have a lot of homework to do before we issue any solicitation. Thank you all very much.